you want me to do a freestyle rap or anything? No. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Don't want to hear dad that. jokes. How about dad jokes? <laughs> and I remember her saying, "Okay, you're going to play Mr. Sin today." And she hands me this purple puppet with a nasty mustache. Pop little puppet up, and literally on cue, eighty kids out there all. Yuck, I hate that guy. I was like, man, these guys are trained on cue. Like, I don't know if they got candy for doing that or what. But. Oh, man. They just want to come down on deep someone. Deep theological teaching. Deep theological uh, teaching. Well. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Together We Build. My name is Chris Benke, and I'll be hosting this episode. I'm here also with Prudence O'Hare. Hello. And I'm not going to ask you how you're doing because I've been scolded. <laughs> Many times in the past. We've also got with us Joni Shepard. Joni, how are you doing? I'm doing fabulous. Fabulous. I'm so blessed to be here. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. This is the second part of a two-part uh, little series um, with Joni. That you, you, If you have not seen the first part, you absolutely mm -hmm. have to see this, the, the first part. Um, Joni tells her story. It is super powerful and really sets the stage for this. I don't know that I'd recommend go do that now. Do that after this one. Just stay right where you are. Watch this one. It's absolutely fantastic. But um, I think the topic, which we're going to get to in a minute, but I think the topic is one of those topics that might you might like not want to watch this. You might want to turn away. You might feel uncomfortable, whatever. But don't do that. Like This is so important. And now the timing of now, which I think we'll talk about a little bit in this episode, the timing with everything that's happening in the world is important and it is more relevant than um, it ever has been with regards to timing and how people talk about it. So we're going to dig into that topic of abortion in a, in a minute, but before we do that, we got to, we got to do our thing, the trivia. Now, the last episode, you both got 100% on the trivia <laughs> questions, which uh, is that's not which true. has never happened it's, in the history yeah, of trivia. These are much harder than the B or not the B. Yes, they're much harder than the B or not B. Um, but I think we should just dive right into it. And um, I think you guys should tell me the answer to this question, mm -hmm. which is how many teeth does an aardvark have? <laughs> aardvark? I'm trying to think of what an aardvark looks like. Are they kind of medium, we have, smallish? Like 32 kind of? teeth or something? 32 or 36 maybe. I have one less than whatever I'm supposed wisdom? to have. I know that. <laughs> I have eight less. Eight less, one less. You have how many less than you're supposed to have? Um, five. This is the... Five? <laughs> Five oh, because of wisdom teeth. Yeah, yeah. and I'm missing wisdom teeth and a random Which pirate I'm not gap. Show you where yes, the this is the is. trivia question I didn't have on my <laughs> list: is how many teeth are each of us missing uh, in the show? Yeah, aardvark. I never had. Um, I never had wisdom teeth pulled. You did. Did you have wisdom teeth? I did. Yes, I just have a tooth yeah, missing. I you had, have a tooth plus wisdom, wisdom, and then you yeah. have four. I had, yeah, my wisdom teeth, and then I had four teeth pulled. For braces, I have a very small mouth, as loud as I may be, <laughs> as big of a mouth as I may seem to have. Small mouth, it's big way voice. too small. Small mouth. Big yes, voice. Um, and then I've also lost actually two other teeth um, that had. Well, one was pulled because of a terrible toothache. The other was pulled um, wrongly. What? It, it, yeah, wrongly. Yeah, it tears the tooth. Oh. Wow. Yes, long story, but it was That's, it was traumatic and stressful. This and, is, this whole yes. show is taking uh, a turn I didn't expect at all. No. Nope. Yeah. Totally so the real question that. is back to the real question, which is how many teeth does an aardvark have? <laughs> um how much wood could a woodchuck chuck? That's what I thought. Yeah. It, I'm trying to Prudence, picture what this animal even just, looks like. It's just kind of like a as you like to say a stab back, out there and tell us how many teeth an aardvark Scott. 93. 93, very close. I will say 72. 72, also very close. How many? 28, also that very, isn't close. very close. The true at all. answer is zero. Aardvarks have oh, zero teeth. What? Now, that's why I was asking what an aardvark is, because I'm like, what do you mean zero teeth? But, anyways, that's what this here question, <laughs> trivia question answer says is none. 
Um, let's move to a very similar topic. What was Marilyn Monroe's natural hair color? Oh, that was um, like Auburn, I think. Auburn? I'll just say red. Red? Is Auburn and red the same? No. Hmm. Auburn's like a brown red. Yes, yes. And how many Agreed. teeth did Marilyn Monroe have? Oh, brother. <laughs> We're not doing this one again. She had 31. The natural 31. Uh, the, the natural hair color of Marilyn Monroe was red. <gasps> Come on! Joni is absolutely... Um, I think you're the only person that's ever got any of these right. So wow, congratulations. Wow. You do win $100 million. All right. Um, In Monopoly bills. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> In doll hairs. Well, I'll take Not it. Not dollars, doll hairs. I can um, use that next time I play. Which Tasmanian marsupial is known for its temper? I know you're going to get this because you've traveled the world. Oh, my. And you're familiar with all the marsupials. Tasmanian devil? Yeah. I. Tasmanian devil is your guess. That's a real thing. <laughs> I'm pretty I, sure. I do know. Uh, I am just... Oh, I am lost because kangaroo. I'm really afraid of calling, saying the name of an animal and it's it not a being a marsupial. Because Isn't at the moment, I can't even think of what what all is included in a marsupial. In a marsupial? I think a marsupial. They carry them, their I'm babies. Trying to get them to tell us the uh, answer. Yes, marsupials. To give us a hint. <laughs> are, they have seven teeth. No, I don't know how many teeth marsupials have. It's more I than none. I don't know. It's, I... They carry their babies in the pouches, You know what, right? Joni? Yes. No one Bad is going temper. to judge you negatively if you say an animal that's not a marsupial. Okay. We do have some Googlers out it's there. It's got to be kangaroo, Chris. It's got to be a kangaroo. It could no, be. It could there's be a... other marsupials than just kangaroos. It could be a wallaby. Wallaby. Oh. So you said Tasmanian devil. You say wallaby. I don't Platypus. know. I'm changing Platypus? my, my, my um, answer to is that a kangaroo. A I don't and know. Prudence is changing her answer to a kangaroo, which is a very bad mistake because the actual answer is Tasmanian devil. <gasps> so you were going to have 100%. The devil you were going to You were going to win $100 million, <laughs> and now you've forfeited <laughs> your victory. I put doubt in your mind. Right. It's my fault. I cannot <laughs> believe you just tossed the correct answer in the trash. Okay. Last one. It is ill. It was illegal. Maybe it still is. Uh, let me read the whole thing. Uh, it was illegal for women to wear what in the nineteenth century in nineteenth century Florence. It was illegal for women to wear what in nineteenth century Florence. Not jeans. Florence, Oregon, Florence, Italy. Jeans. I'm pants? not sure they had jeans. jeans. Must have yeah. been pants. Pants. Okay. Um, a cowboy hat. Cowboy hat. Um, my guess would <laughs> no. be Bluetooth headphones. Um, <laughs> the answer is buttons. Buttons. Now, that seems really crazy. <sighs> how in the 19th century Florence, Italy, how did people? Button How'd, their garments without buttons. Without buttons. Did they have zippers? They must have just had to cover them. They must have just had to cover them with a flap or something because you can do a that. A button flap Possibly. cover? Possibly. Yeah. So, a hook? Uh, do they have hooks? Yeah, I don't know. There's not enough details here for me to have any uh, true answers to our questions about the question, but it was illegal. It was illegal. Wow. So, mm. I wonder why. Probably because buttons are scandalous or something. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Apparently. I, yeah. I don't know, but I do know that uh, Marilyn Monroe had more than none teeth. Like those aardvarks. Wait, was it aardvark? I already deleted yes. it. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, after this episode, I'm going to look up what an aardvark is because I literally have no idea. I need to know also. Yes. We may we'll fill be... you in later in a future episode with... Aardvarks. Could be life changing. It could be life changing. Likely it's not, but it might be. And that is what this show is about. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. All right. <laughs> After that amazing intro of uh, trivia, I think we should switch topics to picking up where we left off before um, from um, Joni's story. Now, again, if you haven't seen the first episode in this two part series, 
you really need to check it out. I recommend after watching this, go back and um, go through the, the last episode because Joni beautifully walks us through her story. Um, her story is one of a lot of pain and suffering that has really led to something incredible, which is this ministry she has now, which we're going to get into. Um, but her story of uh, actually being a Christian, um, going through two abortions uh, in her younger life, and kind of the lack of resources that she found all over the place, and the kind of rejection and shame she felt from the church, um, and kind of the inability to go there for help, and, and also the just the incredible acceptance from organizations like Planned Parenthood, and you know, kind of right there to to help out. Um, and so, uh, I really strongly recommend you go watch that episode. But we're going to jump off from the end of the last episode where you were kind of walking us through your whole story. You've got two books here. Um, let's talk about these two books first. And then I'd love to just jump into kind of the landscape that we have right now today with regards to abortion. Um, we're at a time in history where I think a lot of people never thought it would be possible where Roe versus Wade has been overturned. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what that actually means because I think a lot of people are confused. Um, and then the really the power of what your ministry is and what you're doing to equip churches and leaders with the resources they need to actually be helpful and not uh, painful. Make the problem worse. Make the problem worse. Right. So let's start off, Joni, with the books. What What okay. are the two books um, and where can people find them? Before I do that, I want to tag on something yes, you just said about sure. the acceptance of Planned Parenthood, who was initially were very kind and accepting, non-judgmental, as opposed to my experience with the church. Um, but they didn't remain that way because after my first abortion, I developed a terrible infection. I got, had a fever that shot up to 102. I was in terrible pain, terrible bleeding. I went to them for help. They treated me terribly then. They couldn't wait to get me out of their clinic. It was like immediately following the abortion. Yeah, within like a few days wow. afterwards. Wow. And and I they were not kind at all. They tried to pass it off as they told me, "Well, you have the flu." They treated me very roughly. They examined me very roughly. Um and I said, "I don't have the flu. I know what the flu feels like." Um, you know, you're not bleeding profusely when you have the flu, for one thing. And so they finally said, well, this, the surgeon who performed your abortion is, is not here today. Well, you know, where is he? Is there another doctor? No. Um, they finally wow. gave me the address of where he was across town. And in that condition that I was in, I had to drive about another 20 to 30 minutes to that other clinic where that doctor did admit that it was an infection from the abortion. And he gave me a shot for antibiotics. And without asking me if I had transportation, he gave me a pain shot. And I had to drive home very under the influence of that. And I don't know, wow. you know, only God got me there safely, but it was. So you know. wow. just, uh, I'm curious. Um, I mean, you've had time to really think about that. Like what, why do you think there was such a radical switch? Um, I believe that they are in the business of selling abortions and they are also in the business of telling you that there's no, harmful effects of it. Right. And so they could not admit that and had and to get me out of there. And want you to become a statistic of something not going perfectly and smoothly right. and easy. Never wow. told me to go to the hospital. Nothing. And so... Um, I mean, that is the perfect definition of a politically driven, agenda driven, what it looks like when it creeps over into the medical space. Exactly. That is very scary. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I just had to say that. I yeah. and I I believe that God loves everyone who works for planned parenthood. Mm -hmm. And he he loves them enough that he died for them 
as well. And um, so I love them also. And I don't believe that they're all terribly evil people intent to do evil things. I believe that they are there doing what they believe is the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is the definition of being deceived. Mm -hmm. You don't know right. that you're deceived. Right. Yeah. They uh, really think that they're doing something. They think they're doing something good for the most part. I believe that's the case yes. uh, as well. And so it, I, I really appreciate the heart of your perspective on this because you can speak with authority when you mm. say, hey, by the way, our job is to also love them that's the way right. Jesus loves them, which is the same that he loves us. And it's, I've not gone through an abortion. Um, so it's one thing for me to say it. it's it's powerful when you say it mm. and yeah. it's even more powerful knowing this part of the story that you know once you went through the procedure then they were just kind of like you know uh, we can't deal with you like you are mm -hmm. an anomaly to our our agenda correct right but that they're paid to do those things and you you do what you're paid to do yeah. and um wow. God loves them, and I love them, and I, I want the same hope for them that I've experienced. Yep. Yep. Nothing is as powerful as a converted skeptic, right? <laughs> so, like, how powerful would it be it could, would it be as, as we help people that have spent their, uh, you know, so much effort, um, and we help them see the truth? It'll be, it's incredible. Right. Right. So, so speaking of truth... That. There's some books that you've got there. Yes. So tell us about those. Okay. So the first one I wrote um, is called, Why Can't We Say the A Word in Church? And it's Overcoming <laughs> Our Dirtiest Secret wow. with Hope and Grace. Um, and I wrote this, I started writing it in 2016 when um, God put, started putting this ministry on my heart and initially wrote it mainly for pastors and ministry leaders um, because my experience in, in doing pro-life work, and, and I, I literally don't like the word the term pro-life because it has such a negative connotation and you know even in my mind when I hear it I think you know I, there's been a lot of damage done under that name as well as so much good but it's the damaging right. part it carries that, a lot of weight yeah, yeah. it does uh, but I I felt like because I've seen the church just not talking about this pastors don't talk about it so I just started writing I felt like that was God, what God wanted me to do, and just unpacking it and, and processing through things that I'd never processed through, and I'd never heard anybody else process through a lot of it, and um, it, it just, it, it turned out that it, the beginning of it, it there's, there's three parts, I think, maybe four. It's been a while since I wrote it. I've been writing a lot of other stuff. Four parts. So there's the scenario of abortion in the world and in the church. And, you know, including the um, trauma of abortion and, and all those who are affected. Exposing Satan's dirtiest secret. Um, which is the damage it does to the living victims, the moms and dad. And they are victims because right. they're lied to. Right. Um, and then the second part is the dilemma of why it's so difficult to address this in the church. Mm -hmm. There are valid reasons why it's difficult and, and why we're not hearing about it. And I want to, you know, a lot of people criticize their pastors and, and their churches that, you know, they don't talk about that and they should. And, well, let's, let's give them the same kind of grace that we want God to give us. Um, and then the third part is the remedy, how to overcome those obstacles and those difficulties that are keeping pastors and ministry leaders, and really all of us from talking about this from a redemptive standpoint. The fourth 
section is ushering in a culture of life through hope and grace into the world and into the church. But we have to start mm -hmm. with the church yeah. because when Christians have the majority of abortions, yeah. um, we don't really have any business telling the world mm -hmm. that they need to stop having abortions until mm -hmm. we start figuring out mm -hmm. the problem in-house. Right. Yeah, so powerful. So um, let's let's talk about, so, so the ministry that you have right now um, and, and a lot of the resources that you're creating is specifically to educate church, church leaders, because there's such a gap there. Right. Um, and I, and I want to talk about that, but I think the gap or just, you said something a minute ago that the majority of abortions are happening for Christians. Um, I think there's some, we should back up a second and kind of look at some of the st statistics. I think it's going to be kind of shocking for a lot of people. So let's, let's start with Roe versus Wade. So Roe versus Wade is kind of a very misunderstood law that is now, um, and I, th I, I truly think, thought this would never happen has now been overturned because of a because of another ruling actually so now that this is overturned which is a federal um mandate that is now overturned mm -hmm. a lot of people believe uh that that means abortion is now illegal which is not the case actually really the only thing roe versus wade did was remove by having it overturned was remove a, a, an imposition from the federal level over the states. So really all that's changed uh, initially with that being overturned is that the decision around the legalization of abortion and all the details surrounding it has been handed back to the states, which uh, from a, you know, com from a uh, conservative standpoint, from a constitutionally conservative standpoint, that's a really good thing. The states should be controlling that sort of thing. So what this really means is that the states now are going to put laws in place that dictate abortion. So when that happened, there were 13 states that had what are called trigger laws. So they put laws in effect relating to abortion on the chance that someday in the future, Roe versus Wade would be overturned. And now that it has, those trigger laws have gone into effect. And so there's uh, 13 states where that has happened. And, um, and so a lot of people um, believe that now abortion is illegal in all of those states, which is also not true. So there are a handful of states, I think there are nine, where um, abortion has been significantly restricted, and a lot of the left pro-abortion people would have you believe that it's completely illegal. But actually, right now, in this time where we're filming this, in none of those states is abortion completely illegal. In fact, in all of those states, now they're trying to change this rapidly, so there's a lot happening, but... In all those states, even where it's illegal, it's after the heartbeat. So there's still uh, this loophole, uh, heartbeat detected, right? So there's still this loophole, and, and when is that, and how many weeks, and how do you detect it, what method used, all these different things. So all that to say, for the majority of the states in this country, nothing has actually changed. And there will be some states where they'll make abortion even easier to obtain. So the, what, what, what I mean to make sure you understand by explaining that is, is that we don't get to just rest and say, oh, now everything's taken care of. Because there's several massive issues. The biggest issue, honestly, has nothing to do with any of these laws. It has to do with the whole reason Joni started her ministry, which is there's still very little decent education. And this is across the board for non-Christians, for Christians in the church, out of the church, pro-abortion, um, anti-abort. Like, there's still very little education. That's the biggest issue here in a lot of ways. Um, and then on top of that, there's still a lot of laws that need to be um, dealt with. One thing's for sure, that the attorneys over the next 50 years are going to make a lot of money fighting about how to deal with this situation at the state-by-state -state level. So I just kind of wanted to lay that out there. And then I think it would make, uh, I, think it would, I think it would be valuable to help people know some of the context with some of this with some statistics. Like, for example, um, most people don't realize that 20% of all pregnancies, now 
all these stats that we're talking about are, are only in the U.S. There are other countries where this, it's far worse condition than this. But in the U.S., in the United States, um, that of all pregnancies, anytime a woman is pregnant, 20% end, those pregnancies are terminated in abortion. And I think most people have no idea it is that significant. And now that Roe v. Wade is overturned, there will be um, less abortion, likely. Um, but it's still, as of right now, going to be pretty much the same 20%. So there's still a, a large battle ahead. Um, this is a major hurdle that's been removed in fighting that battle, specifically with regards to abortion. But it's very, very shocking to a lot of people to realize that 20% of 100 babies, 100 women that become pregnant, 20 of those women will end that pregnancy with an abortion. And then I don't have the exact statistic, Joni, you might, um, but, but the other shocking part is the majority of those, so I, it's not like 90%, but the over 50% majority of those are actually Christians or claim, uh, right. claim to be Christ followers of some kind. Right. So can you speak to that? Well, there has been two major studies done. The one that is quoted most by the pro-life community is one done by Lifeway Research for CareNet that is an organization that is like a parent or organization over um, thousands of pregnancy centers in the U.S. and around the world. Um, and in that study, they surveyed, I think it was 1,013 women, something like that. Don't quote me on that number, but it was around that. Um, and nearly 70% of those women identified as Christians at the time of their first abortion. Wow. Oh, my goodness. That is And so that is quoted amazing. a lot. And then nearly 40% of them were going to church regularly at the time of their first abortion as well. And um, there's a lot of other, other points to that study. But there was another study that was done, um, I believe in 2015. Could have the year... The year is mixed up, but um, where they, <clears throat> Guttmacher, did a study on over 8,000 women at the time, you know, while at, when they were getting their abortion, um, and 54% of those identified with the Christian faith. And the, the first study I mentioned is quoted most often by the Christian community, um, pro-life organizations and people, I believe that the, the difference between that 70% and that 54% is um, who they surveyed. So, What was their sample? Yeah. The, the study that was done by Lifeway Research was surveying people who'd had abortions over the decades. The study with Guttmacher was done at one point in 2014 or 2015, and so it was at that time that they were having the abortions. I believe the difference in those two statistics is that back in 1973 or 1980 or whatever, there was a higher percentage of Americans who identified right. with the Christian faith. Right. And so, right. therefore, that study over the decades is going to have a higher percentage. Um, and that's why, so I would, I would say the 54% is probably more accurate for today. Um, over the decades, I'll go with the 70%, but right now. And... Um, I think the important, the more important statistic is that um, the, the more important thing we need to focus on is that the church is not addressing this and doesn't right, know how right. to address Comple this. Completely missing it. And yeah, yeah. we can't... <laughs> all the people who have suffered and are suffering 
because of the trauma and the loss and the guilt from abortion that are sitting in the church on Sundays or during the week um, are doing it in silence. Yeah. Now, um, I, I want to... Uh, so I, I want to get into specifically the equipping of the church and the need for it. And to kind of set that up, um, Prudence, you grew up in the church. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious. I mean, we didn't, I didn't even, we didn't even prep for this, but I'm just curious, like <laughs> you from your, uh, your vast experience, just literally your entire life being in the church, what kind of resources and education were you given? How was abortion talked about? Was it talked about? Like, what did you know about it? Was there educate like, from your perspective? Um, yeah, I, you know, um, we were taught that abortion was wrong, it was horrible. And um, we're also taught, you know, the basic don't have sex before marriage and, all of that. So those basically the two messages. Um, there wasn't a lot of education about how one got to those places. <laughs> Do you but feel it like it was? It was. I think the energy of the church was a, a certain disdain for the um, the people that had the abortions and also it wasn't talked about that it was happening within the church that was not something would have that I would have never, never guessed, guessed this it was statistics always Joni was talking about the outside world was to blame for and this do you feel like if mm -hmm. you were to mm -hmm. become pregnant or go through an abortion like that you would be able to go to the church to get support in any way? Or do, would you have known for sure you can't do that? Kind of like Joni's experience. Um, yeah, I, I would have been very hesitant to say anything because it was such a, um, a horrible, horrible thing. Um, mm. And again, it had absolutely... No place in church, much like what you were saying. And right, so, yeah. Um, so, so what I want to, so what kind of what I want to, how I want to go with this, and what I want to learn is, um, I think that a lot of people are shocked by the statistics, and I think a lot of people have felt the shame grid. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if I ever find myself in this scenario, um, then I know this is the group I literally yeah. can't get help from. Well, it's it's a vicious cycle is what it is. It's really a vicious cycle because the very place where people should be able to get healing and um, accepted for m moving into that healing is not happening because they can't. Right they're not in a position where they feel like they, A, the church has healing for them. And that's a big problem. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> like there, there's. Because a lot of times they don't is what you're saying. Right. Like they're yeah, not equipped. It's not, not, not equipped to, to help people heal from these things. And um, so. So I want to. So as we talk about that, I want to look at it from the perspective. Make sure that you both agree with me as well. Who? So the target of the of the enemy, right? Like literally, okay, Satan after us. His job, well, not his job, but his his job. He assumed kill, steal, destroy. Okay, so like basically, he hates God. He wants to be like God. So. Who's the real victim here? And I think um, he Satan has done a great job getting the church to focus on the babies. And and I don't want to. I'm not trying to belittle anything, but at least I believe uh, they're all in heaven. They're not his target. His target it, are the women. Is to the disrupt men, the lives, kill, of, steal, yeah. and destroy. Yeah. So if God creates every single person on earth with an assignment and a purpose then he's going to 
mess that up any way he can. What an incredibly powerful way to do it and to make sure that the church is not equipped to help people that are tied to this scenario in any way at all. He's basically killing a couple of birds with one stone. It's very efficient. With abortion. Right? It's very yes, efficient. Yes, that's a good way to put it. And also, besides focusing on the babies, um, I believe the enemy has been very happy that we have been so focused on politics, legislation, mm -hmm. changing laws, because as long as we keep it not a personal issue... Mm -hmm. As long as we talk yeah. about some law that yes. lawyers can argue about with big, massive vocabularies, then right. it's clean. It's over there. Right. If we feel like we change a law, then, wow, we've accomplished something big. But... I am convinced that Satan is not afraid of laws mm -hmm. at all. Right. Yeah. And here's why. Because we think, okay, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, abortion may, maybe there's hope that abortion may become illegal everywhere in the United States. And I believe as, as somebody, as a Christian who chose abortion under great duress, mind you, um, if you equate something that's legal as, with something that's okay, that's not harmful. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, take mm -hmm. um, laws about marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people who never even tried it before are more likely to yeah, try it or sure. use it. Right, right. Well, I, I look at other countries, other places where abortion is not legal. Two that come to mind, the first one is Pakistan. Well, you'll probably never get any statistics from them because abortion is illegal there. And yet people I know who live there, who are nationals there, who are Christians, and I've heard this from more than one source, that they have, um, that nearly every woman will have had an abortion mm -hmm. or more, multiple yeah. abortions wow. there. Wow. Why? Because not only is abortion illegal, but being pregnant outside mm -hmm. of marriage is illegal. Yeah. And there's, so there's only one way you can go with that. Right. <laughs> right. And yeah. so, and for Christians, Christians are sinners also. Mm -hmm. And um, they have all the influences from the West, you know, all the pornography, um, the American dress, the, our influence, but they don't have any guidance as to what to do with all of that. And because of the culture there, they, men and women never talk about these things. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and Christians are often very poor there. And they don't feel like they can afford a child. And there are plenty of Muslim doctors who are happy to reduce the Christian population and provide mm -hmm. abortions. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is just what I have kind of analyzed through in my head. Um, then I look at the um, island of Jamaica. Abortion has never been legal there. And yet, they have an abortion rate as high as the state of New York, which mm -hmm. is one wow. of the highest wow. in our nation. Never been legal. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is you got to change the hearts. Exactly. That's a heart people. issue. It's exactly. an education issue and a heart mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. Because Satan isn't afraid of a law change, right. but he is terrified and works very hard yeah. to keep us from changing mm -hmm. anybody's hearts. So I really yeah. I really love the the way that you're talking about this because I don't hear you saying that that changing laws that that's good. That's part of the equation sure. too. Sure. We need to stand but up. But it's so easy to look at that and just have that be clean and neat and tidy and yeah. that just solves our problem if we could just mm -hmm. do, like just get these lawyers to solve our problem. But that's not that's just one small little sliver, a little facet mm -hmm. of the real problem, which is a heart problem right? and an education problem. Mm -hmm. And that is the thing that I think so many people, because the, the enemy has been successful in this, I've never even really thought of it like that. Like, 
what? Because the position that we've all been put in is to look at it as a political, politicized, agenda-driven, narrative-driven thing. So, so take us, so, so then, okay, so now Joni and your ministry okay. of helping and creating education resources um, to literally address this problem that we've been talking about. So what are you... And all of the effects that people have no clue that are yes. attached to this... Actually, let's start with one that. One thing. Let's start with that. that the everybody that are thinks not so that it obvious. just affects the woman, which is huge, mm -hmm. but it affects not just her. So right. much more. Right. Um, definitely, the woman, you can't not be affected by it. Of course, you can be in denial that you're affected by it, mm -hmm. and that happens across the board in the majority of abortions because you have to go on living. So you have to convince yeah. yourself you that have you're to cope okay. Somehow I'm okay. Yeah. I'm okay. I'm okay. You tell yourself that while you're um, drinking more mm -hmm. to cover that pain that you're okay about. Mm -hmm. Or you start using more drugs or you become more promiscuous like I did. Yeah. Um, or um, you there's this elephant in the room with um, the man that who, who fathered your baby and mm -hmm. you never talk about that mm -hmm. and he's in pain too mm -hmm. because he is also affected whether he pressured the mom to abort mm -hmm. or he tried to talk her out of it. He has lost. Mm -hmm. he, he is somewhat traumatized as well because yeah. his child was... He was um, a part of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was a part of it. And then there's the grandparents mm -hmm. of the the baby, the the dad's parents, the mom's mm -hmm. parents, um, who often are play the role of um, pressuring or coercing, sometimes forcing the woman to abort. Yeah. They have their own responsibility in it. And even silence is a responsibility. Even saying, I just want to support you and what you want to do. Right, right. Mm. That's, yeah. that's playing a role that's taking responsibility mm -hmm. um, to not speak Really, up. there's no way, if you're, if you're associated, there's no way to not play some kind of role. Is yeah. really Correct. what you're saying. Yeah. Everybody's right. playing a role. Everyone's affected. Right. And for the church, silence is a role. Yeah, and I believe that by it, it, her silence, the church perpetuates mm, abortion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we've learned nothing. We're not talking about it. Uh, you know, we're not sharing testimonies like my story about what abortion does to us. Mm -hmm. And we're not speaking the truth about what God's word says about life. Yeah. And so the next generation is. Are, are making the same choices, the same mm -hmm. mistakes. Yeah. And it's our fault because we didn't tell them. Mm -hmm. We have wow. not talked about it. And wow. so we played a role in that. Yeah. And because we haven't talked about it, it continues to happen. And the only way to stop it is to start talking mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so what, so, so yeah, so set that up for us. Like, how do, there, there are people that are watching this that have that have some kind of experience. Maybe mm -hmm. they've had an abortion. Maybe they know someone. Mm -hmm. Maybe they contemplated one. I don't know. There, like, there's so many more people that are associated than we're really being led to believe. Like Correct. you said, Prudence. Like, no, like, the abortion doesn't happen in the church. Well, actually, <laughs> it happens more in the church than right. outside the church. So. So what then is the role now that there are people that are listening to this right now and they're kind of like, oh my goodness, like you just unlocked all of this stuff I didn't understand before. What's, what's the next step for them? The next step is start talking about it as uncomfortable as it is. Start learning about it. Mm -hmm. Start educating yourself. Um, this is a great book, not just for pastors and ministry mm -hmm. leaders, but um, it also includes... Uh, my story broken up into the different sections as different parts of it relate. Um, in writing this, it made me realize how many aspects there are to my story and right. to every woman's story. Right. Mm -hmm. 
there's so many aspects to it. Um, and uh, what I did when, I'll just mention this, right before this was about to be published, I thought, hmm, there's a lot of people who aren't going to want to read all the facts and statistics and the how to overcome this, because this does tell you how to change this. But some people are just going to want to read the story. And so that's when I did right. memoirs. Mm -hmm. I extracted all the story. I added a prologue and an epilogue. And I um, added some more stories and, and added two of the stories that are um, in the A Word book. And it's about a two hour read. You can read it on a plane flight, you know, across the states. Mm -hmm. And um, it, there's a lot you can learn from it. It also talks about things like, well, why? How, how did this happen? Um, how did abortion become such a big thing for Christians? Well, abortion was legalized between Nixon's second um, inauguration as president and his and the ending of the Vietnam War. So those were the big news items mm. because I was 12 years old and I don't ever remember my church saying anything about, oh, abortion became legal, you know, I don't remember that. Um, I think I would remember it if it was a significant thing, you know, that was brought up. And then, of course, I think it was a month or two later was the Watergate scandal. Mm -hmm. And right. so it just kind of right. slipped, slipped in under in. the radar. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, pastors and ministry leaders just assumed, like, like they Everybody do. Everybody was just behaving themselves. Yes. <laughs> we have good little boys and girls in our churches. You know, our people yeah. would never have sex outside of marriage. And so yeah. it was never it was never even on their radar mm -hmm. that anybody would be having abortions. At the same time, um, the mm -hmm. enemy was working fast and hard in the family. And I believe that Christian parents were taking their daughters to, to get abortions. Mm -hmm. um, also under the church's radar from the get-go, as soon as it became legal, because they could, because nobody was talking about it and nobody was going to counter them on it. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody assumed that they never would. Yeah. So really what I'm hearing through every single one of those was a combination of ignorance and denial. Exactly. Exactly. And, and deception. Deception by the enemy. Mm -hmm. And I think most people who are not Christians know that Christians are just as bad as everybody else yeah. in our hearts. Mm -hmm. I mean, we may be a little more righteous here or there, but we still have the same propensity to sin mm. as anybody yeah. else. And what do they call us? Hypocrites. Hypocrites, yeah. yeah. So yeah. if you were to say something to a, um, a woman, whatever her age may be, or girl, um, about, you know, say they're, they're contemplating abortion or they have had that abortion, like, what would you speak into them if they're keeping that a secret? Like, mm. what encouragement would you give them to say, hey, don't hold on to this? Right. Are you talking about the pregnancy don't, or any, any of after it. So having, okay. Don't do it or after, have, have if it's happened it. to you, mm -hmm. don't keep it a secret. You know, get that Correct. help. Get it out. Right. So there, there are many churches that are not safe. Mm -hmm. And I will say that without any qualms. Yeah. Because they're not. Right. Um, they're not safe places to confess sin because if you confess your sin, then other people feel more convicted about theirs and a lot of times uh, they don't want you to do that. Mm. And so they're more likely to judge you and still pretend they're okay. When real in reality, we're all sinners and we all deserve God's wrath without mm. his without Jesus dying, that his blood shed for us. And um, I'm a sinner every day. So if you're in a church like that, that's very judgmental, 
Um, I wouldn't recommend you going to your pastor and telling him about that. I think that's that. super important. You, it's, it's, you, so you're not saying keep it hidden, but you are saying be smart about finding mm -hmm. resources. Mm -hmm. And right. your ministry is working hard to educate these churches. And on your ministry's Correct. journey, don't hold on to it if this is you in the situation, but yeah. you also need to find a place where yeah. it's safe. Mm -hmm. And they are, they do exist. They do exist. Yes. Um, but I don't want you to be wounded all the more. Mm -hmm. It's um, because it's, uh, the enemy certainly wants you wounded even more. And so... What I would suggest is um, if there's a pregnancy center, a pro-life pregnancy center mm -hmm. in, in your community, contact them. They probably have abortion healing Bible studies, which is awesome. And, and you need healing. Mm -hmm. And don't listen to the lies in your head that you think is coming from you. Um, that you don't need that healing. Right, that's so good. And yeah. just take that, take those steps. Go through that healing. Once you're, you've gone through a certain amount of healing, and remember, it's a journey. You you don't reach a point on this earth where I'm perfectly healed. I'll yeah. never yeah. struggle from that again right. because you'll always regret it. You'll always be sad about it. Mm -hmm. um, but you. It doesn't have to destroy your life, and yeah. you don't have to do destructive things to cover it up um, or to make yourself feel better. But once you get that healing, a little bit of healing under your belt, then you can go to your pastor and tell him in an empowered state of mind, look, I went through this, mm -hmm. and I've struggled deeply from it, and I don't think I'm, I know I'm not the only woman in this church who's been through that. Is right. it possible That's that so we powerful. could do a healing yeah. Bible study here? Mm -hmm. Right. And men too. We need men. We need men to mm -hmm. become men. Abortion of all things, birth control to start with, but... Mm -hmm. That's another story. Um, yeah. But abortion has um, demasculinized men and told them, you don't have a say. But, and, mm -hmm. and men are hurting, and men need to know your God-given role, mm -hmm. that you need to start making a stand. Yeah. God has placed you as protectors over women and children, mm -hmm. and you need to stand up and wow. take that role on, mm -hmm. because that's what God Come has on. given you. Man, that is so good. That is so good. So, so Joni, I just, um, you know, we're kind of out of time now, but I think in the next one, I, I really want to, I really want to unpack this place that the church needs to move into. I know there are people that uh, listen to this um, program that um, are involved with ministries or churches mm -hmm. or whatever, or um, that they have been involved. Maybe they've had an abortion. Maybe they are connected family member or something like this. And any of those people in any of those scenarios, and if you're like, well, that still isn't me, then uh, trust me, you know someone that's in one of these scenarios, mm -hmm. have a responsibility to solve this problem. And to solve the problem, if what we talked about over and over again was the ignorance and, um, ignorance and, what was it? Well, I thing? said deception. Deception. I can't remember what the third um, one was. <laughs> that's a, that's a, a thing that we all need to work on. Mm -hmm. That's not like one person's job mm -hmm. to fix. And we can't continue to kind of push this over to the political and say, well, the lawmakers need to fix this. Because you, I really love the way that you kind of unpack that. You can look at places where abortion is completely illegal, has been, in some places it's always been, and it's still a, a, a rampant problem because... It's a heart issue first, right. and um, and I just I love the way that you kind of unpack that. So, what I think we should do right now is, what are the resources that people need to go to? How do they find those books? Uh, we know they, they can find them on Amazon, and there's also your website. We'll put some right. of that stuff in the show notes as well for you. But what's the easiest place for them to find these resources? Well, as you said, um, either Amazon, where they're available in paperback or Kindle. They're also available in paperback at Focus on the Family, and I would love to support Focus on the Family. 
Um, also available Kindle Unlimited, which is right. free That's right. on Amazon. Um, my website, hopinggraceglobal.org, um, will take you to those links. That's fantastic. That's so, awesome. Yeah. And we are actually in the process right now. Joni is here in Bend, Oregon, and she is working with us at Kingdom Learning to produce some e-courses that will be available in uh, pretty soon as well. So we'll link to those as well. But at the, at the end of the day, I think what I'm hearing, a lot of the problem is stemming from a lack of um, understanding of really what's going on and denial mm -hmm. that there is a problem. And we just can't do those things. Well, and for all of us to have some responsibility and take and understand what our roles Absolutely. and parts are to play. But because, I mean, even if I'm not the, the gal that's had the abortion or is thinking about the abortion, you know, I still have a role to play in something right like my supporting. language language just, supporting mm -hmm. being there for someone and this else. is yes, all this education. is all of our mm -hmm. issue it's not mm -hmm. the woman's issue it's not yeah. just the women the moms and dads issue it's all of our issue because we've all lost and the church has been damaged by this mm -hmm. and i think many people don't go to church anymore because the church isn't yeah. speaking relevantly yeah, about these Which things. Is being very hypocritical. And, but what I want to get before we come, yeah, before yeah. we close, is that there's hope mm. that mm -hmm. um, God has given me a lot of insight into how to overcome this in the church, mm. and it's not mm -hmm. as difficult as we think it is. Yeah. The enemy wants us to think, well, that's impossible. Right. That's so you good. can't do that. Mm -hmm. But we can overcome god has given us the power to do that mm -hmm. and and there are certain steps to do that that is mm. so good it's so there's there's always hope right mm -hmm. and it's super um, it's almost cliche to, to say that but it's actually true mm -hmm. and i love the way you just said that the enemy wants us to think that this is a problem we can't solve and sometimes you look at numbers and you're like millions of babies and you're like oh that's too that's too big that's too big that's exactly what he wants us to think. Right. right? And um, there, there's hope, there's answer, there's resources. And if we're all playing a part, we're going to be significantly more effective. And, um, and then remember who the real target is here. Right? right. It's all of these people. And I, you said it really well, like there's grandparents, there's the, there's fathers, there's sisters. There's, it's like all, it's all a lot more victims than just that woman that made a decision. Um, and I think that right. that education is so important. Prudence, yeah. I feel like you got something well, to say. Well, I think that we need to remember that every single journey, and we're talking about this as a journey throughout life, mm -hmm. begins with a single step. And so keeping that in mind, we're never going to get anywhere down the road. We don't mm -hmm. start taking steps. Right. Even if they're baby steps. Mm -hmm. Any step. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Any step right. is like, going to help. Like, <laughs> tell your friends and your pastors to watch this show. Yes. Watch these last two episodes. That's right. Yeah. That's right. All right. Awesome. So, so if you haven't seen the, the, the first episode in this series, that's where Joni really unpacks her story. Go check that out. Um, definitely take some time to go through that. Share it. Um, and then share this episode as well. And then you're going to want to for sure watch the next one. And we're going to dig into some uh, more of these topics. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for um, following Joni's resources are there in the show notes as well. Look that stuff up and help us get this message out. We will see you guys on the next one. Thanks. Thanks.